we turn our attention to the Hebrew book of the prophet Amos. In the words of Amos, who was among the shepherds at Tekoa, near Jerusalem, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Jewish, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he said, The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn, and the top of Carmel withers. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you. As you have said, hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord, I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies, even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs, to the melody of your harps I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And then the words of Jesus some 750 years later taken from the Gospel of John. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. <coughs> Excuse me. Our church year ends in two weeks on Christ the King Sunday, or Reign of Christ Sunday. I'm always glad to be with you and in the pulpit for that. On that day we celebrate and envision the greatness of God, the glory and reign of Jesus Christ, and on that last Sunday we ponder all that will ultimately come to fruition and end in Christ, with Christ as the one who has dominion over all. We will sing hymns that make us feel good, that God is in charge, that God is sovereign, and it is our Father's world. But we are not there yet, in more ways than one. There is, there is a gap, there is a breach, between the reign of Christ and the world we find ourselves in. Like you didn't know that. <laughs> this morning we hear from Amos, the first biblical prophetic book. Amos was a shepherd, a prophet, and a fierce champion of justice. Amos was an older contemporary of Isaiah. He lived in the kingdom of Judah, and he preached in the northern kingdom of Israel. He lived 750 years or so before Jesus. Amos is addressing what he calls the remnant of Joseph, the remaining followers of Israel. The word remnant um, means the small remaining quantity of something. But Amos doesn't use the word remnant 
to refer to their numbers being small, but that they are fragile, delicate, and essential followers of God. Amos is concerned that the followers are not seeking, loving, and doing good, but instead are choosing evil. The choice for evil can be intentional and direct, or it can be passive, like apathy or cowardice or just being unaware. Amos infers that a remedy to evil is the establishment of justice. If we were to establish a McDonald's on the corner, we wouldn't be remodeling it or improving it. To establish it means that it doesn't already exist. Amos suggests that justice does not exist and that the wrath of God may be withheld if the remnant followers, fragile, delicate, and essential as they are, begin to get it right instead of wrong. Prophets do not speak only their own words. They bring a message from God. God is judging the moral irresponsibility of this community as it relates to justice and righteousness, good and evil. And the judgment, the indictment, goes out to all. Amos goes on to speak God's words in verses 16 and 21. God is speaking words about the worship of the community that must have been unfathomable to the first hearers. Yahweh's day, or the day of the Lord, was considered a glorious celebration of the Lord's presence when ancient redemptive acts were renewed liturgically. Amos helped redefine the day of the Lord from a day of celebration to a day of wrath. In verse 21, God says, I hate your feasts. I hate that you're gathered together doing this. This delicate, fragile community thought the worship they were observing was important and meaningful to God. But God said of their solemnity, God said of their, solemn, of their solemn assemblies, sorry, God said of their solemn assemblies, of their great music, much like ours, I'm sure, their various offerings and sacrifices, that he despised all of that. Why? Because they were going through the motions of worship, but the works of God, the witness of God, the justice of God was not being established in the world outside of worship. Jesus speaks of the same problem 750 years later in the passage we heard from the Gospel of John. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. He wasn't standing up in a Presbyterian church. He was standing up at a Jewish temple. He's saying their elaborate worship and sacrifices are not what matters. What matters is that we should thirst for Jesus, thirst for the things of Jesus, and we will be quenched. Out of the hearts of those who are nourished by Jesus, he says, will flow rivers of living water. That's the Holy Spirit. So, our year is winding down. Our church year. Our calendar year. And your partnership with me in the Doctor of Ministry in Preaching degree that I am seeking from North Park Theological Seminary is coming to a close. This morning is the last assigned videotaped sermon that I have to do. This is the last sermon that will be evaluated by my advisor and my professor. 
you folks will no longer be required to critique my sermons. <laughs> Officially, that is. The sermon that I'm to preach this morning is to be a prophetic one. I should be speaking in a way, I should be preaching in a way that compels and urges you to take action when we leave here. I actually took a course at school this summer on prophetic preaching. I did that to get over something of an aversion that I've had to prophetic preaching. The seminary I attended in Washington, D.C. had a beautiful chapel with a massive pulpit. It must have been mahogany or walnut. It was magnificent. And you knew you were preaching when you were in that pulpit. That pulpit instilled in me a sense of responsibility and a sacred trust whenever I am in a pulpit of any size or configuration. One of my classmates described himself as a prophetic preacher. Declaring yourself a prophetic preacher in second year of seminary to me is a little like volunteering for the Humility Award. My sense is that if you're really prophetic, like being humble, others are the best judge of that, not you. That said, he was very good. He was a Serbian American. He was a big guy. He had huge hands. When he got behind the pulpit and started raising his voice and pounding the sides of the pulpit, well, Amos had nothing on him, I suppose. I think that what Amos said of the people of Takua could also be said of our little community here. He called them the remnant of Joseph. He said they were delicate and fragile and essential. I hope that you like that description. I love that. We have traveled a holy peace these last three years. In my preaching project each year there has been a theme based on what was going on here in dialogue with those of you on my committee. In 2015 we preached resurrection in the face of death, <coughs> decline, and transition. In 2016 we preached hope and mission in the face of death, grieving, and transition. In 2015, the death was saying goodbye to our building. In 2016, the death was saying goodbye to Marion Maher. What we might not have predicted as we were preaching on death, decline, and transition was that we would have as many or more people here as we had over there. This year, the theme is preaching hope and mission during transition. Our transition continues. I believe there are ways in which Amos wouldn't be as harsh in his critique of your community as he was of his own. During these years of transition, years of pain and grief and uncertainty and struggle, two things here have stayed strong. One is your sense of community with each other, and the other is your fantastic sense of mission and outreach. Many years ago, a funeral director closed his funeral home to retire. But even without a funeral home, a hundred families a year called this funeral director to be of service to them. He used other funeral homes to do this. My friend Sal Madania used to say of this man, he does a hundred funerals a year without a screen door. And you, my friends, with not much more than a screen door, have done great work for the reign of Christ with your food pantry, Mission Council 8, 
your generosity, and your ministry of presence. Just as your natural inclination has been to mission and outreach, the words of the prophet Amos invite us, actually command us, to do more. Amos thought the gap between how God wanted the world to be and its reality was vast. And for as much as the world is different today than it was 750 years before Jesus, how well we know that the gap is still mighty and wide. Ripped from the headlines, I would like to reflect on two disturbing issues confronting us today that cry out for justice and for action from the body of Christ. The first is gun violence and how we may almost be getting used to the increasing frequency with which mass amounts of people in this country are being massacred. No other civilized country has the amount of mass shootings that we do. I have a hunch there are a lot of uncivilized countries that don't have the amount of mass shootings that we do. When I experience conversations about this, someone will slap someone's hand and say that guns don't kill people, people do. Agreed. It's people that need healing. It's people that need reconciliation. It's people that need redemption. It's people that need background checks. It's people we have to do a better job of screening. And it's people we need to keep away from military type weapons. Then someone will slap a hand and declare Second Amendment rights. The Second Amendment gets interpreted much more liberally than its intention. Besides, I wasn't baptized into the U.S. Constitution. I was baptized into Christ Jesus. The second issue, which is staggering, may be bringing hope. There continues, almost daily, to be an avalanche of people coming forward and calling out people in all walks of life that have sexually harassed them. It blows my mind to think of all of the people who have been sexually harassed and abused simply as a result of going to work. And we only know about the people who have made that public. My mom has a hard time believing that people wouldn't speak up or speak up sooner. Not every allegation is true, no doubt, but it is very much true that people don't speak up, are afraid to speak up. And as disgusting as it is to have all of this coming out, we may end up at a place where sexual harassment particularly in the workplace, will be dramatically diminished. We are watching justice being established. That was what the prophet Amos called for. That was what God spoke to Amos about, was the establishment of justice. That's what Jesus spoke to us about, was that we should be thirsting for the things that Jesus thirsted for. For justice. My friends, we have come to that happy place in the sermon where we ask ourselves, so what? So what? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. So what does the prophet Amos have to do with us? What, what do we have to do with gun violence and sexual harassment? God detests worship that doesn't go beyond our walls. Amos tells the community that we must establish justice by seeking 
loving and doing good, not evil. Maybe you or me or we have to change our views about gun violence. Maybe we have committed sexual harassment or enabled it or taken it lightly. Maybe we have to do more or do something on one or both of these issues. Or maybe there's another issue of justice that speaks to you. Maybe we should speak up, be supportive, be an advocate, be an activist. Maybe all you can do is pray. Then pray. Our worship must transform and change us. We must establish justice. Yesterday, a friend of mine said of a friend of his who died, she was a beacon of light in a world gone haywire. She was a beacon of light in a world gone haywire. I love that. Let's be beacons of light in a world gone haywire. Our work is not over. The gap is wide. Meanwhile, God calls us and waits for us and commands us, you and me, to do justice. And whether we want to admit it or not, whatever God calls us to do, God will also equip us to do. Remember, we are remnants. We are delicate. We are fragile. And my friends, we are essential. We are essential. You are essential. 